This is room A, yeah. So it's too late to move now, I'm afraid. If you're already, uh, <laughs> if you wanted to be in the other one, that's it. Close the doors. Um, so, if you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Evans. Um, I'm a blogger, writer. I used to be a consultant um, in IT, and I'm going to talk about software-defined storage. Is it fact or is it fiction? And just talk around some of the the um, the issues r around, you know, the use of software-defined storage in general. So, where did it come from? What's the original definition, and what, where, you know, why, why would we want to go down the route of software defined? Well, if you look back to about four years ago, is it, 2011, Mark Andreessen, who's the founder of Netscape and obviously a big investor in the uh, in Silicon Valley, he came up with this expression that said, "Software is eating the world." Um, and what did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was that hardware is becoming commodity. The margins on hardware are a lot thinner than they used to be. And all of the value of um, our IT is going into software. So as you can see from the picture there, you know, we, we have plenty of examples, but IBM are a good example of one company trying to get out of the hardware business, selling off their older assets, and trying to move into a, into a software and services business. I'm not going to talk about services, but in general, you know, we get the idea that people are moving away from selling hardware, and they see much more value in, in the software. So how does that affect us with storage? Well, it can't happen to storage, you'd think. Surely storage is immune. Surely we still need to run stuff on hardware, and storage will always be run on hardware. At least that's what a lot of people would think. And I guess, looking around the room, I'm trying to see, I know we have some NetApp people in there uh, sitting over there. I don't think we have an EMC sitting in the room, but I'm sure, EMC, fantastic. So I'll be, <laughs> I'm not gonna have to change what I say. <laughs> what I, say. I, I was gonna be quite negative there, but no. But <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll, I'll rein it back slightly, but you know. Oh, okay, fair enough. So I'm gonna get hit in three different directions. Um, and I'm sure if you talk to the major storage vendors, they would be very happy to say, to still see you selling uh, or buying hardware from them. And, and a lot of those companies are set up for that, you know. Their, their salespeople are good at it. They know how to sell hardware to a customer. Um, and customers know how to uh, consume that hardware. You know, they know, they know what it means when they buy something. But, um, but ultimately, you know, it's not necessarily where the market's going. So. Let's just take a step back a, a second and talk about storage in general. And, and really, storage has always had issues and still has issues. And the typical usual suspects of storage, of problems at storage are exponential growth. We hear that all the time. And I think Enrico mentioned that, you know, does that really happen? Is it really true? And certainly from my experience, it is. You know, I see people consuming up to 100% growth a year. And it's just, it is crazy what people will keep. Um, usually MP3s, usually videos they shouldn't have on there, but you know, mostly people are, are keeping whatever they can. One of the big problems with some of the older technologies, not going to pick on any particular vendor in question, but a lot of the older technologies have real issues with management. You know, they're, they're difficult to manage. You're having to use um, people to do a lot of that work because they're not automated. And the reason for that is because the legacy original, a legacy design of them meant, you know, you needed to understand how that box was put together. And of course, that means that we have a, a lot of cost involved there, and we, we don't have um, the ability to be agile or to be as flexible as perhaps we would like to be in the modern world, especially with some of the application techniques we, we, we're using now. So this got discussed again this morning. You know, surely the hyperscalers have, have sorted this problem out, and you'd think that they've sorted the problem of storage out, so why can't we just use what, what they've done? Well, actually, it's not that simple. So this is, a, um, this is a picture of a Google server from 2009. And what I love about this, this picture is the fact that up there, that's the UPS. They just soldered a battery into the chassis because they didn't want to invest in expensive UPS for the data center. You know, they just decided, we'll just solder a battery into each server. If the power goes, those, those devices will just carry on running. And it's not particularly high tech, a couple of drives, power supply, cheap motherboard, but it works, you know, it works for their purpose. And if you look at um, another company doing something similar, 
which is a bit more modern these days, um, Backblaze, you know, they're designing their own hardware, but they're designing it for a purpose. So they've got lots and lots of custom disks, a server in there, you know, a, a disk to boot the OS up. <coughs> the, the issue there, of course, is that for people like Google, this is pretty easy because, you know, they've got a small number of apps and they run a huge number of those applications out there. They build a redundancy, redundancy into the application, very different to, to the way that you might do it in your own data center. And very much it's a read-centric architecture. And I, would, I would can't remember whether it was Nigel and I were talking last, no, last night or the night before about this. And we were saying that basically when, if Google lose your data and you don't see something come up on a search result, it's, well, you know, so what? If you lost it, you lost it. They'll re-index it another time. They'll go back and re-index that, and it'll, it'll reappear again. You don't care if they lose the data. So if one of those servers died and it had to be rebuilt, who cares? It's no big deal. And of course, all of that stuff was delivered free. So you know, why should you expect you were going to get anything out of that? So in reality, our own private data, data centers are probably very different. We like to think we're a bit special. And I think definitely storage people like to think they're a bit special. Not as special as the network people, perhaps, but certainly storage people like to think they're special. And I can say that because Tom's not in the room, so that's, then he's not going to have a go at me for it later. Um, you know, we, we, we've got very different requirements in a, in, a, in a data center. We having just got single monolithic applications. We've got applications that have specific SLAs and need certain levels of availability and performance. And downtime was money. So you bought expensive equipment because it guaranteed your business would run. But surely we can do it better. Surely, you know, why do we have to keep on buying this expensive stuff? Couldn't SDS do it? Couldn't storage, sorry, software-defined storage do it? Couldn't virtualization help us there? Well, what does it actually do? And one of the things that I think was mentioned on the panel earlier today was what, how do we define it? And we'll come on to the definition in a second, but, but ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to abstract ourselves away from these hardware issues. I really honestly don't care what the hardware is that sits underneath it, as long as the availability and performance <laughs> works at the right cost. Um, so I want to get that, I want to abstract away from that. I don't want to even have to care what that is. Um, I also really don't want to be involved in the provisioning process because I'm just in the way again. I'm just another bottleneck into getting stuff out into production. And more importantly, in some of the places I've worked, I didn't want to be the guy who was do, doing the decommissioning. Because if I took down something, something that was running that was a live service, I'd be the guy who'd be walked out the door. So I'd rather automate all of that stuff so I don't have to be getting involved in it at all. And basically, if you can do that, then that's a great opportunity to reduce costs because you can re, um, repurpose those people, put them somewhere else, or just, you know, just get rid of them. So <clears throat> how do we define SDS? Um, I went and picked out a couple of definitions, and I picked out the Wikipedia one, which is not too bad. You know, um, policy-based management, independent of the underlying hardware, all that sort of stuff. And then you look at the SNEA one, and it's all a bit bizarre. It doesn't really seem to actually even make sense as a, as a sentence, but so theirs is a bit sort of a bit vague. So we, I tend to sort of ignore that one. Um, what we do know is, as Tom mentioned today um, on the panel, um, you know, it evolved from SDN. So I'll give you my definition. And this is what I, th I like to think this is what should be in the definition of SDS. Abstraction. So I'm, and I'll try not to read them, but I'll, I'll, I will read them out. IO services should be delivered independent of the underlying hardware. What do we mean by that? Well, I mean, if you put a box in and it's got a load of flash or a load of disk, I don't want that uh, response to change for that customer if I put twice as much disk in or twice as much flash in there. I should be getting consistent performance. And I, d I want to talk about logical things. I want to talk about LUNs and volumes and file shares and repositories and hopefully eventually VMs and you know, all objects rather than that strict physical way we used to do it years ago. I I'd like to have the whole thing completely automated. I don't want to be logging in and having to do provisioning. I want somebody to do it for me. I just let, I'll just expose that framework for somebody else to come in and do that. I also wanted all policy and service driven. So if I put an application on there, I want it to be mapped to a service level. So an application gets a service level. And then I, I want to use abstract terms like IOPS and latency that are independent of that hardware. And I want it to be scalable. 
So I want to be able to add more stuff into the, into the environment, grow it, and not have to think about things like forklift upgrades and horrible migrations and all the other stuff that we've had to put up with for years. <coughs> I, love, I, I love the fact that in the, the definition that's on the screen further back, People seem to focus on the idea that everything should be delivered in commodity hardware. That the whole idea of software-defined storage means we can't ship some hardware with it. And I think that's just a stupid, stupid concept. EMC have been using commodity hardware for years based on x86. HP's three-part platform uses um, x86. Uh, VSP was done on x86. Everything's been commodity for years. So why, are we, why do we even have that as a discussion? Let's move on. Oh, it didn't come out the right color. Look at that. It's come out in like a, a yellow color rather than a green one. Um, but bespoke hardware isn't bad. You know, 3PAR had the, uh, has had a custom ASIC. Other, other vendors do it. The only thing you need to avoid, to do, to avoid doing is building a homer and trying to put every single bo uh, piece of bell and, uh, every bell and whistle into that particular uh, solution. What about storage virtualization? Well, Sorry, just real quick. yeah, sure. Can you go back? You said just don't create a homer. Um, yeah. I would, I would almost make that an analogy to what uh, some of us are trying to do with, with hyperconverged systems. So do you, yeah. what do you mean by that? So <coughs> where's the, ne do, where's do, the negative? Do you understand, do you know, what, do you know the, um, the Simpsons episode that comes from? So Homer, um, Homer meets his long lost brother, who turns out to own a, a car company. Okay. And he, la he lets Homer redesign the next car for the company. Okay. So Homer decides to build something that's got every single possible feature <laughs> in it all custom built, all in the hardware, um, in the car. And it bankrupts the company, and his brother goes out of business and takes him forever. So my, my point is that, you know, if you're going to use some bespoke hardware, there's nothing wrong with that, but we don't need to go back to that, let's create it so bespoke that everything's going to cost a fortune to build. What you know, build? yeah, so, you know, from a simplicity perspective, you can build a dedupe um, card that can go in the server that fixes one problem, and the rest of it stays as commodity. And we just don't need to go back to those days of complete bespoke hardware. I'm glad that you said it up here because I think it's bespoke. That's a good conversation. What I don't like is that yep. people don't leave room that there's actual innovation potential in the hardware. Yeah. Everyone is just so focused on the software. There's still innovation potential in other places. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll come on and I'll, I, th I think I'll discuss it in a couple of slides. The whole issue of the, hard, the hardware discussion is still valid because if you, um, if you think that you can just use any hardware, then you're going to find all the corner cases, all the things where the driver doesn't work properly, and you've got an old disk from years ago that has a funny bit of firmware on it. You know, you can't just pick any old hardware. Well, you can, but you, you, know, you, you potentially have a risk. So what have I got? 12 minutes. Let's keep going. Um, so storage virtualization, what was the point of this? Well. The idea of storage, storage virtualization years ago was to, again, abstract the underlying hardware from the way you delivered it. But this has been around for years, too. We've had this for an awful long time. And in fact, a little bit of homage to um, EMC there, um, storage virtualization is at least 25 years old because we had it in the first um, disk arrays when we abstracted away from the physical disk and we created log logical RAID volumes. So we've had it for years. So there's nothing, there's nothing special in it. But it does give you some real benefits. You know, you can, you can move data around a lot more efficiently. You can be more flexible with it. You can reduce costs and, you know, you can be more efficient. So you could actually use cheaper hardware and make it look like an expensive box. These products have evolved quite a bit. Um, and we've, we've ended up with, I, th I think, three generations. There's the, the monolithic one, which is the uh, virtualization that was, say, done by HD, uh, HDS or Falcon Store, where the, the application sits in, in line of the data, isn't very highly scalable because it's a very monolithic design. Um, we had a second one where we looked at uh, having centralized metadata, but we distributed the access, the actual data path. And primary data is probably a good example of that. They have metadata uh, servers, but they distribute the, um, the, the data path between servers. And then we're moving towards now towards totally distributed environments where we have total distribution of the metadata, total distribution of the data path. And we, just, we can just scale that out much more effectively. So storage virtualization still has a real benefit there too. So what does it let us do differently? And I guess this is the ultimate point about why we'd even bother 
talking about software-defined storage and why we'd even want it. It allows us to do things like have more flexibility. You know, you can choose your own hardware. You could already be buying service from somebody, and you could deploy it all on one, on one solution. You could, be, you could deploy a hyper-converged solution and just throw away the, the storage appliance altogether. Um, we can be more agile, so we can push services down to the storage, as we discussed earlier on today. You know, we could actually say, let's throw the application onto that box and run some containers on there, and people are doing that already. So we can be more, more agile. We can be more efficient. We can use the old, old technology we, we don't need anymore. Um, and more interestingly out of this one is probably the, the second last one there. We can now get a bit more transparency, and we can start to see where the, the vendors were actually charging us an awful lot of money for their hardware, and where they were marking up what were probably very much uh, commodity devices and putting a big markup on it. Um, and I'm sure that's not something that EMC or HP or, or NetApp want to hear, but it's true that you, know, you get a lot more exposure to the price now. <clears throat> but what about the negatives? There have got to be some negatives, surely. If we're going to go SDS, there's got to be some negatives. Well, naturally, you're, if you've got an SDS solution from somebody, and, and if, if that vendor just gives you the software, they can't test every, every combination of hardware. They can't test everything. You know, they could, they're, they're limited in their test environment, and they may not be able to even build that test environment for you very quickly because they may not have it put together. So you could find yourself in a position where you have an outage and nobody can help you. That's not a really nice scenario to be in. That is definitely one of the things you paid for when you bought big iron storage from somewhere, somebody like EMC. You could be on the phone with them, and they could, they, they could be logged into your box, and they could be testing that problem and find it in the lab really quickly. And if that was worth money for, to you, then you know, that's why you bought from those, those vendors. Performance profiles, always going to be difficult to gauge what you're going to get for your money. Again, when vendors have done all that testing for you, unless you do a lot of the testing yourself, you're not going to know. So you're not going to know how a system is going to scale very well unless you test it out. And this one's a really interesting one. Little or no shared experience. One of the interesting things about the, the vendors that are coming along now is they're putting analytics into the cloud based on their customers' data. And then they're looking at that and saying, do you know what, that drive might be the type of drive we don't want to be shipping out to the, into the field because it's got a fault or it's got a problem. Or we've seen customers do a certain configuration that causes a problem, and we've seen 50 customers who've got this problem. So we know it's something we should tell the rest of our customers. You're not going to get that with um, a lot of the software-defined solutions if they haven't got any sort of call home facility or that isn't built into the way they work. So you could lose out big time on shared experience. And of course, SDS doesn't fix all the problems. It doesn't solve our problems of data migration or data protection or anything unless it's actually better written software than the stuff you were using before. It can still just have all those same issues. <coughs> so should we use it? Is it, worth, is it worth having it? Well, it depends, I guess. If I, if I was a customer now looking at whether I wanted to use software-defined storage, I'd try and find some good use cases for it. I'd look at, say, could I put it in a branch office? Could I put it in a, uh, a remote office and, and try it out there? It may well be that that works better than trying to deploy lots of boxes because I haven't got the support model to support um, hardware in every location. <coughs> I might look at a scale-out archive and say, well, do you know what? We'll, we'll create an, an object or, or a NAS environment and we'll use that first because that's a nice, easy one to try. Or I might decide I like the idea of hyperconvergence, and that is clearly something that's gaining in popularity. So <clears throat> as we come to the end, I thought it would be interesting to have a look and see how many vendors are in the market today vying for your money. Um, years ago, it might have been a very small number. But now, and this is my NASCAR slide of all the storage vendors I could find, um, there's a huge number. And in that, in that list, a huge number of those vendors are software focused only. Absolutely software only, with, with no hardware component to their offering. There's a huge number of people that could be knocking on your door. So <clears throat> in conclusion then, I do believe SDS is a fact. It exists. It's existed for a long time. And in actual fact, it does give us loads of benefits, and we should be using it. We should be looking at it as an option. It's no longer just a hype expression. The expression might be hype, but the actual delivery of the technology isn't. 
It definitely is out there. The question is, it's just a case of now, how do you cut through the hype? And how do you choose which of those vendors is somebody you want to actually talk to? And who's going to have a, so a solution that's going to deliver to it? And with that, um, I'll leave you a few links. If you want to follow me online on Twitter, you can get me at that, that address. I also have a blog. I also have a website where I work as a consultant. Um, and you, you know, if, you, if you want to talk about it, I'm more than happy to engage. So in the last couple of minutes, um, anybody have any questions? Anybody like to uh, make any comments? Do you think what I've said is true, apart from the Hedvig people, obviously, who are bound to say yes, because they're going to come up and say that next. next and I've probably set you up quite nicely, I guess, have I? No? Yep, OK. Yeah. And it just becomes like we just have a long transition ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. And from HP's perspective, you've been trying to do that for a while. So you know, so you've got still virtual, which is as you know, you could use. Um if if you'll ever bring out a three par BSA, who knows, that would be great. I'm sure lots of customers would love that and yeah. would take that. Never, but yeah, you're a <laughs> but it is a it is a, it is a long journey. You're right. It's definitely a long journey. OK. Any more questions? I was just throwing a cost in there. So you have roll your own solution, basically, where you come up with your own configuration. Yep. Um, it's kind of a long, drawn up process. Um, and then there's either you know, custom nodes or purpose built appliances or something like that that kind of mitigate a lot of that risk. Yep. Right. The people were just using nodes they had, and it wasn't working because the race car didn't have proper queue depths or whatever. So I would just caution those of you in the room to really take a hard look at that before you're making that roll your own decision versus this is Dell or whoever has this pre-config box that's going to work. So there was a there was um there was a Reddit article that was I remember reading relating to vSAN where. A customer deployed it. Um, a node had failed because it had a memory fault. And they hadn't spotted it. And after 60 minutes, it went into rebuild. And it took down the entire complex because it just spent all the time trying to rebuild the data. So the whole thing collapsed. And they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't work out how long it would take to rebuild. They couldn't work out how far it got in the rebuild. So they had to just leave it until it finished. So you're right. You have to still go through that same due diligence, whether it's a roll your own or whether you're, still, you know, you're buying from another vendor. I don't think that changes your, you know, your acquisition process at all. Yep. I, th I think you know whether you're, whether you're talking about a bespoke box or whether you're talking about software defined, you've still got that acceptance process to go through and, and understanding. And I think you still have to look online and say, you know, what are other people's experiences with all of these products? Because none of that changes. It's still the same. Sim still the same issues. And that's another way you're seeing people deploy stuff. So I think the early vendors who were coming out with software-only solutions have started to bring out appliances to, to go with their software because they've realized that people actually don't want to go through that process themselves necessarily. And actually, having an appliance which has been t at least pre-tested to a certain degree means that it's a lot more consumable for them. The choice there, I guess, is whether that vendor can provide every single server vendor's solution. And some of them are these days. And there's a vendor side to that as well. So the, there are armies of people at Microsoft and VMware that do nothing but qualify gear for HCR management. Yeah. And there's entire processes that go on between vendors of making sure that your software works on their servers and vice versa. 
I mean, the, the appliance model, I think, is what really gets you past that. Yeah, that yeah. Hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I th mesh up. I think. Um, anyone wanting to go to the other room? Uh, we have ah, okay. So, thank you very much for your time. If there's any more questions, do give me a shout afterwards. Thank you.